There's a story in a John Lee's autobiography where he's a young monk staying in a forest. And the villagers nearby come to warn him that there is an elephant in rut. It's been running around stabbing people with its tusks. They tell him he should get out of the forest if he wants to be safe. But he decides to stay on. And sure enough, one afternoon he's meditating, sitting under a tree. And the elephant shows up suddenly in the clearing, with his ears back, looking ferocious. And the John Lee's first thought when he sees the elephant is that in just a few seconds he could be on me. And before he knows it, he's trying to climb a tree. But just as he grabs hold of the tree, a voice inside him says, You're afraid to die. Those who are afraid to die will die many deaths. So he gets back in his position, sitting and meditating, staring at the elephant and spreading lots of goodwill. As he says, fighting the elephant off with metta, with no holds barred. The elephant stares at him for a while and then lowers its ears and walks away. There are two lessons to be drawn here. One is that lesson that if you're afraid to die, your fear is what's going to keep you dying. This is a theme throughout the practice. As the Buddha said, the thing that misers fear most, i.e. poverty, that makes them misers is precisely what they're going to create through being misers. If you're afraid to give because you're afraid of being poor, you're going to keep on being poor. The same when you meditate, if you're afraid of the pains of meditation, then you're going to come back again and again and again, being reborn, having to go through aging, illness, and death over and over again. More and more pain. So as John Lee says elsewhere, you have to learn to see pleasure and pain as words that people speak in jest. In other words, don't take them seriously. You realize that there are some pains you have to put up with, but you learn how to relate to them in a way where they don't have power over you. I've been reading a book on the history of fear in Western civilization, and this is one of the themes that comes up again and again. The nobility say the reason they're a nobility is because they don't fear, fear death, whereas ordinary people do fear death, which is why you can keep them down. Well, that's precisely what your defilements are doing. They keep you down. And if you want to learn how to depend on your own mind, if you want to turn your mind into its own refuge, you can't let yourself be afraid of pain. Because if you're afraid of pain, your fears can order you around, and you can't depend on yourself anymore. That way you're confined by your fears. Your own mind confines you, and other people can use your fears to confine you. So when pain comes up in the meditation, learn to look at it in a way that it's not so oppressive, and that we can sit for longer periods of time and take the advantages of having a mind that has been quiet for long periods. You learn a lot about the mind as you sit for long periods of time. But you're not just putting up with the pain. You want to comprehend it. That means viewing it from a position where you don't feel threatened by it. This is why we work with the breath, to make it comfortable. And then we can look at the pain simply as a phenomenon to be studied. And taking that attitude right there changes the relationship. You're not running away from it, you're stopping and you're looking at it. And like a John Lee under the tree, look at it with goodwill, saying, this is something I want to understand. And you 
can begin to see that the pain is one thing, the body is something else, your awareness is something else. And you learn how to take apart the perceptions that would tell you otherwise. And make sure you don't view yourself as being victimized by the pain. This is why I like that perception of the pain as being moments of pain. And as each moment arises, it's not coming at you, it's going away. That way you're not the target. And the pain goes, goes, goes. And you're not gathering it up. All too often we gather up the pain that we felt for however long the pain has been around. We carry that with us. And we also carry with us the anticipation of how much longer it's going to last. The past pain is gone. The future pain is not here yet. Don't weigh the present moment down with more than it can take. And the lessons you learn about how the mind creates suffering where it doesn't have to can liberate you in ways that you wouldn't imagine. So that's one of the lessons to be drawn from that story that John Lee tells. The other lesson is that when you are fighting other people off, you fight them off with goodwill. There's another story from later in his life as a monk who's leading a group of lay people off on a tudong, and they stopped at the edge of the ocean, staying in a forest right there, coming down to the sea. And one day as they're sitting in their meditation nets, their meditation umbrella tents, and John Lee sees a huge cloud of mosquitoes coming in off the ocean, so calls out to everyone. Get out of your mosquito nets, sit in meditation. He was going to fight off the mosquitoes with goodwill. Again, no holds barred. And after a while, the cloud of mosquitoes dispersed. The principle here being that when you do take on other people, when you get into a conflict, Always fight with goodwill. Don't just decide that you're going to abandon your fears and do whatever you think is the brave thing, because sometimes bravery can be foolishness. The French have a word, déchaîné, unchained, which means going berserk, which is what you don't want. When you decide to overcome fear, it has to be with goodwill and wise for your long-term welfare and happiness. So it does require courage to practice, but courage tempered with wisdom. That's what real courage is. It's not just foolhardiness. The courage when you see that this is for your long-term good. And that you're willing to put up with the difficulties in the meantime. One of the Forest of Johns was asked one time, what special quality did he have that enabled him to find the Dharma? And he said, with all due humility, that he didn't have any special qualities except for one, which was that he dared to do the practice. Another one was studying in Bangkok and going back and forth with whether he would want to go off into the woods to practice. After all, in Bangkok at that time they were teaching that the time for the noble paths and fruitions had passed. He was wondering if he went off to practice. It would just be a lot of useless pain. But then he realized the Buddha didn't, didn't set out the practice, as he said, as an executioner. It's not there to kill people to cause them useless pain. It's there to free them. And he began to realize that it was his fears that were hiding behind the official line that said that the practice was impossible in these days. 
And so he went out to practice. The practice does require courage. When you look at your doubts, they get in the way. Oftentimes the doubts are hiding fear. But you want to make sure that your fears are not confining you, that in being afraid of certain things, you're not chaining yourself to them. Like the misers who chain themselves to poverty because they're afraid of poverty. Or the half-hearted meditators who chain themselves to more aging, illness, and death, and more pain, 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 because they're afraid of the pain of, say, an extra hour of meditation. If your fears can confine you like this, other people can use your fears to confine you. Your defilements can use your fears to confine you. So have the courage to set yourself free.